go live then. Yeah, yes, please. Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of Cold Vale's Cabinet. Um, <clears throat> before I start the meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with apologies for absence and just mention to those who, who haven't yet, who are not yet aware, that um, regrettably, Councillor Susan Press has agreed to that she needs to stand down from cabinet at the moment for reasons of long-standing health problems um i'd like to place on record my thanks to susan for the work that she's done during her time on cabinet and to confirm as already notified to members that i've appointed councillor jenny lynn to take on that portfolio and welcome councillor lynn to her first meeting um, Unfortunately, for those of you watching on the screen, we're slightly struggling with the technology at the moment, so it does look as if we've got two council scullions. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I think people will 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 work out who is who as uh, as we go along, and we'll try to sort the uh, the technology another time. So, other than that, I don't have any apologies for absence. Item two is to remind members to of the need to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests or other interests and that they can either do that now or at the relevant item on the agenda as and when they become aware. Item three, I'm going to scroll my screen up. Item three, there are no items to be taken in, in private, so there's no need to exclude the public for any item on the agenda. Item four is to receive minutes of the cabinet meetings held on the 2nd and the 7th of September, both of which were circulated with the agenda. I'd like to move those as a correct record. And can I ask for a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Scullion. There are no, I'm not seeing anybody raise any points of accuracy. So can we confirm those as a correct record? Thank you, cabinet members. Thank you, that's agreed. Item five is question time, which starts off with any questions that have been submitted in advance by members of the public. Um, I understand that there are three. Um, the first question is from Elizabeth Townsend, and I think um, head of Ian Hughes, head of legal, I think you're going to read them out. Yes, thanks, Tim. Um, first question from uh, Elizabeth Townsend in connection with HIPAA Home uh, Library. And uh, she asks, uh, I understand that HIPAA Home Library is the fifth most used library in Calderdale. The community wants the council to keep HIPAA Home Library open. If the council really can't continue to provide library services, then as a last resort, is there an option for the community to get involved to enable the library to remain open? That's the question, Leader. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, Jenny, I know it's your first meeting, but um, you want to respond to that? Yes, I'd like to thank Elizabeth for her question. Um, and we will obviously be coming on to that in the, uh, the substantive report. But I'd like to say that certainly at this stage, we would welcome in, um, engagement from any um, community organisations or participants that might be interested in helping to repurpose any of the libraries which we are unfortunately no longer able to retain but that will be the part of, that will be um, covered in more detail in the report but thank you very much for your question and certainly um, we will take that take away and note your interest in HIPAA Home Library. Thank you. Thank you and I should add that normally we'd also follow up and provide a written response which may provide a little more information. I should have said that at the start. Okay, the second I've been notified for is a question from Anne Hardy. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, Anne Hardy asks, uh, what maintenance programme has been undertaken at Halifax Swimming Pool while the facility has been closed? Is Halifax swimming pool ready to open? And what criteria is being used to determine when it is safe to reopen the wet side and dry side facilities? 
Thanks very much. And again, we thank, um, thank Anne Hardy for the question. Um, on that one, I think we will provide a detailed response in, in writing. Um, we only received that quite, quite late this afternoon. There is quite a bit of detail about the work and issues around Halifax Pool and rather try to give a quick answer from memory. We'd like to give a, a written response on that one, which will be provided as quickly as possible. And the third question is from Ed Greenwood. Yes, thank you, Dita. This is uh, a rather longer uh, question. Um, Mr. Greenwood states that it's recently br been brought to his attention that the item to be placed before Cabinet on the 5th of October 2020 to propose closure of Elland and Selby Bridge waste recycling centres due in large to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, may he bring to the notice of the Cabinet the following information. There are two estimated contracts pertaining to local authority collected waste and commercial and industrial. Now, those are contracts involving collections service, uh, largely sewers, and treatment and disposable service, sorry, disposal service, largely AWM and Renew I. Investigation has highlighted that over the recent six months of COVID restrictions, vis a vis the same periods in the previous four years show that the collection related waste charges, CETA, has increased by just 10%, whereas treatment and disposal charges have increased by 21% since the same period 2019-2020. It could possibly be due to increased levy of £32 per tonne by the Netherlands from 1st January 2020, which AWM would probably charge back to CNBC. Mr. Greenwood says that investigation has also shown that the expenditure trajectory implies an underspend of 4.8 million uh, is possible on the remaining four years of the estimated cost of the AWM contract, but an overspend of 5.9 million pounds over the remaining 12 years of the estimated cost of the CETA contract. Therefore, does the cabinet concur that a decision to stay the proposal be made until a robust cost benefit analysis, social impact assessment, extra vehicle traffic and consequential pollution, economic assessment and stakeholder analysis be undertaken by the appropriate scrutiny board? That's the question, Ada. Thank you very much. Um, obviously there's a lot of detail in there, but I don't know, um, Jenny, if you want to make any um, Yes, well, just just to begin by by thanking Mr. Greenwood for his um, for his question. Um, I have had a look at it. I think some of the figures, um, you know, perhaps wouldn't quite recognise. Um, and for the record, I understand that the um, our waste contract is due to finish in 2024, but actually with an option to to continue for a further eight years. So in fact, there is effectively a great point. But I, if you if you will excuse me, because I'm fairly new to this, um, I would prefer to actually have a chance to discuss the matter with officers and then make a, an appropriate written reply in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, that is all the um, public questions I've had notice from. I haven't had notice or indications from any councillor wishing to ask a question. Um, I suspect if council, council, there are a number of councillors who may, non-cabinet members who may wish to comment on item seven on the report and it's more appropriate to take those matters then. So um, with that, I will move on and uh, mark the end of question time. Thank you. And take us on then to item six on the agenda, West Yorkshire Plus Transport Fund and ask Councillor Scullion, Jane, to introduce this. Chair, I wonder um, about the item on the minutes, item four. I thought I did that. <laughs> both, both sets. Yeah, both yes, I, I, I moved them both. I, I cheated and moved them both together, Jane. Yeah, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but Ian didn't tell me I couldn't, so okay. I assume I am. <laughs> Apologies, I, I wouldn't like to um, uh, make any assumptions. Um, this paper, um, uh, item six on the agenda um, is about something called a side roads order. And I thought I should perhaps just explain to those watching, I know all councillors already know this, 
but to those watching what that is. Uh, when you engage in major highway improvements, very often as a matter of just tidiness and just in case, you make a, a side roads order at the same time, which allows you, should you need to make any changes to the junction or the visibility lines of a particular road, um, that you can do those as part of the main highway works. Um, and this uh, particular uh, report in front of you uh, relates to the A629 phase 1b scheme and the background to this request to cabinet is laid out in sections 2 to 2.3 and this particular proposal is um, has been some years in the design um, some years in the bidding and the financing for this work and also in getting the relevant permissions and approvals and the point that officers have come to after all this time is that they no longer need to, to have the side rows order. It was approved by cabinet and therefore to be removed, the removal also has to be agreed at cabinet. And therefore the recommendation is at 3.1, which is further to the cabinet approval of 23rd of April, 2018. It is now recommended that cabinet approve the side road order be withdrawn and that the Secretary of State and the single objector, there was one objection to the side roads order, be notified accordingly. So in other words, the side road order, if cabinet agrees, will no longer progress. That's all to Thank say, you. I'm happy to go into the detail. Uh, there are some, some maps in the um, uh, report. I'm very happy to answer any questions, Chair. Okay, that's fine. I'm happy to second that. Um, can I see if there are any questions or comments on that item? I'm not seeing any indications. So in that case, I think you moved the recommendation, Councillor Scullion and I seconded. Can I see all those in favour? Okay, thank you. That's agreed. Uh, Okay, item seven, future council delivery plan phase one. Um, there are already quite a number of people who've asked to comment on this item. So I think I'll just remind members at the start um, how I intend to handle this uh, as normal. So that's um, cabinet members will introduce and comment on the report first. I will then go to the various non-cabinet members who've asked to speak when, when cabinet members have had their say. Um, come to each one in turn, take comments, and then come back to Cabinet for a uh, decision and to consider recommendations. Um, I'm going to start by reminding people of the context, which is the, um, the financial situation we face. Um, to date, the government has not kept their promise to stand by this and every other council as we strive to do what is needed to keep communities safe and thriving in the face of the virus. And that is the single biggest reason why we're facing a financial crisis and why we need to take action now and not leave all of the decisions until the February budget. Local government across, across the board have been clear with central government about the impact of the virus and the actions that we need to take it, which go well beyond the direct costs of additional services and spending, important and significant though they are. And so I want to take a few minutes reminding colleagues of the various elements that are going to hit our finances now and into the future. The first one is, of course, the direct costs of additional services. And whilst those may be covered and remains to be seen how fully by central government for now, we already suspect that many of those extra costs are going to need to continue into next year. And so far, there's no, no assurance or certainty about whether those will be funded. But that's just one element. The second, of course, is the loss of income from fees and charges. And we previously warned at the last meeting that the government scheme to compensate for this is wholly inadequate, will cover only a fraction of the actual loss and will leave a gap of many millions of pounds. Thirdly, our officers are advising and we anticipate a long term loss of income from both council tax and business rates again with no guarantee that this will be recognised and compensated for by central government. The fourth factor is that existing saving plans have often been put on hold or interrupted or made irrelevant by the impact of COVID. And finally, 
it's important to emphasize that it's becoming clear that as the impact of the virus will continue into the next financial year, there's going to be a continuing impact on the cost and the income from many of our services as it's going to change the way in which many services operate. All of those costs together add up to the estimated impact of up to 20 million pounds in the next financial year, which was set out as the worst case in the medium term financial strategy. And I do just want to emphasise that it is those costs in Calderdale, but with similar impacts in, across local government as a whole, that the Conservative government can and must make provision for if they're going to honour the promise they made at the start of the pandemic. I find it frustrating that they are making almost uncountable billions available to private contractors who frankly are really not delivering. And yet it appears they're not, re they're not ready to commit to providing the support that councils like Calderdale need to sustain the local services our communities value and depend on. I'm going to go next to Councillor Dacre and then to um, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Dacre. Thank you, Leader. Uh, yes. Um... Following on from what uh, Councillor Swift has said, I want to make the point that it is absolutely devastating for a Labour cabinet to have to bring forward yet another report setting out cuts to be made to our public services. Nobody should think that we want to do this. After all, we are Labour and we believe in public services. Covid has ca caused a crisis, but the crisis has been brewing for 10 years. The crisis that all councils face in their finances is a result of 10 years of Liberal Democrat, Conservative coalition government and Conservative government cuts to council budgets across the country. So Calderdale has lost around 115 million from its budget since 2010. It's lost over 30% of its staff. It has worked really hard to try and maintain levels of service, but it is extremely difficult. And this crisis has really precipitated um, even more severe cuts to be made. In particular, and these points have to be made uh, again and again, government has not grappled with the adult social care funding issue, which together with children's services accounts for approximately two thirds of the council budget and which the local government association say that factors are relating to those costs, about 70% of those costs are not within council's control. They, they cannot do anything to reduce them. So it is a nationwide crisis affecting all councils run by all parties and by independents. Anyone who seeks to blame Calderdale Labour or Calderdale Council for the cuts we're having to make should read the Local Government Association submission to government in advance of the Comprehensive Spending Review this autumn. The Local Government Association, for those who don't know, is an association for all councillors of all parties and independents. Its current chair is a Conservative. This submission is, it's measured but it's a quite devastating critique and criticism of the way in which local authorities have been funded for the last decade. It talks about needing a cast iron guarantee that COVID costs will be met in full. It refers to the fact that traditional means of delivering efficiencies have been exhausted. It asks government for an additional 10.1 billion pounds in core funding by 2023-24 simply to maintain current service levels and even that is in addition to the inflation rise and being able to raise council tax by two percent as people have been doing over the last few years so at the moment this council along with many other councils in the country has no option but to make further cuts to meet the need for the the legal requirement to have a balanced budget both this year and next year and to make the council resilient. So in terms of this particular report, it's the first step in addressing savings in the process that was agreed at the September cabinet. 
and it deals with a number of public services. And it, we note that in public services alone, there is an underlying deficit of 0.9 million pounds that has arisen because the council has been unable to make planned savings. That isn't even taking into account the 7.6 million pounds of costs that have arisen from dealing with COVID. So the public services that, it, that we're talking about today are, those public, are the ones that face the public, that in case, the case of waste and libraries are used, by, uh, waste in particular is used by all residents. And the council is proud that it's fought to maintain a high level of public services over the last 10 years. And it has also to be pointed out that Calderdale currently has a higher level of service in many of these uh, services than do other local authorities, particularly in, in the north. We've retained more libraries. We've retained a weekly and extremely comprehensive doorstep recycling service. We have an unusually high level of household waste recycling centres. We provide public halls for events. We simply cannot carry on with this level of service with the current levels of projected budget pressure. It will be difficult to carry out these cuts, but we as a Labour Council will do our best to maintain the Calderdale's 2024 vision and our Labour priorities of dealing with the climate emergency, reducing inequalities and developing thriving market towns. We believe that Calderdale residents are resilient, adaptable and generous in crises. And we're, we call upon you, that on our residents, to use those strengths in the difficult times as we have to move forward through making these cuts. So, we will be moving on to discuss the proposals in the report, but if any other cabinet members wish to make any general comments, I think Councillor Wilkinson may wish to come in. Well, Councillor Wilkinson, and then I'll go to Councillor Scullion. Thank you, Leader. Um, this is a, a situation that no council and no cabinet would uh, wish to find themselves in, and yet, just like councils up and down the country, uh, here we are. I'm proud of this council's response to the coronavirus pandemic and especially proud given that just weeks before lockdown we were hit by our third devastating set of floods in recent years. I think the resilience, worth ethic and determination that was demonstrated by our staff and continues to be throughout these challenging times has been remarkable. But due to the costs of the crisis and the government's broken promises, we're left without the funds to keep all of our much valued services going. And it's the very services that most people see and use regularly that are unfortunately the ones that are going to have to suffer. I was going to mention the LGA's submission on the comprehensive spending review, but Sylvia has uh, already covered that comprehensively. But I think just to reiterate that figure of £10 billion that they're talking about that is needed as an injection of cash to local authorities just to keep services at the level they are now real, really sort of demonstrates the scale of what we're talking about here. For months, just like other councils, we've been warning that without further funding, we'd be left in a position where we'd have to review all of our discretionary services. And while the financial position for this year has improved, we're still left with a gap of many millions of pounds for the forthcoming years. And this has been quite clear in the financial papers that have come to Cabinet over the course of the past few months. And yet, from what I've seen on social media these past few days, from the opposition parties, particularly, I have to say, the Lib Dems, uh, they, they seem to be acting now as if it's all a big shock that we're reviewing discretionary services. And the political posturing that we've seen from them this past week has been incredibly disappointing. For example, telling the public that we could afford to keep all our waste collections going if only we cancelled the building of the new Halifax bus station. Now, either this shows a complete lack of basic understanding of how local government spending works, or it's a deliberate attempt to deceive the public. Cancelling capital projects which are being paid for by government or the West Yorkshire Combined Authority will not generate a penny to pay for public services that are paid for from our revenue budget. 
and I'm sure Councillor Baker and his colleagues are perfectly aware of that. It's not the first time we've seen this sort of political opportunism from the opposition rather than any constructive attempt to address the very serious issues in hand. Virtually every single saving or money generating measure that's been brought forward in recent months has met opposition, yet we've heard few credible alternatives and certainly nothing that would generate anything like the £20 million that could be required in the forthcoming years to balance the council's finances. Rather than simply opposing everything that's put forward, it's about time opposition members spelt out exactly how they would make the savings that are now required. And it's also perhaps time some of them took responsibility for the austerity that their government have inflicted on councils in the past 10 years, which has meant that we're in the worst possible position to withstand this crisis. We've already seen £115 million of cuts to our services in Calderdale since 2010. Councils have lost £16 billion nationally. And all of this means that we're now left with few options to make savings on and only extremely difficult choices. As Councillor Dacre said, the continued failure of the government to address the social care crisis has placed an enormous financial burden on the council, meaning that an ever increasing proportion of our budget is spent helping vulnerable adults and children. This leaves very little money left for us to spend on the universal services that we're all most familiar with libraries, swimming pools, recycling centres, waste collections. We'd all like to see our much valued services protected across the board, but it's simply not possible anymore. We desperately need additional support from government or there will be many more difficult decisions ahead. As we make those decisions, I want as an, as an administration to stay true as possible to our values and priorities, dealing with deprivation, tackling the climate emergency, investing in our towns and of course protecting all our communities from COVID-19 and with these in values and priorities in mind there are some options in the paper specifically around libraries and waste and recycling that I think warrant further discussion and consideration but I expect that we'll come to a more detailed discussion about each of the service areas in the paper. But given the pressing need to address the unprecedented financial situation we're in, we must, in my view, regrettably, get on with many of the savings that are outlined. Thank you, Leader. Thanks, Adam. Um, OK, I'll go to Councillor Scullion next. He wants to talk about some of the proposals. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just sad. I'm really sad hearing the things that people have um, said and the fact that we're dealing with not just the situation to do with COVID, but the cumulative effects of, of the cuts. And I'm really sad as a ward councillor, because there are things as a ward councillor that we have not been able to afford for a long time. And that's really what affects our day-to-day, -day, <coughs> excuse me, our day-to-day -day work. I really like really fantastic, well-funded youth services. I think it would make a difference really to antisocial behaviour and all kinds of things. Um, I'd really like to see our parks blossom again and to have park keepers and gardeners there. I'd really like to see our fantastic network of footpaths and rights away kept up and our glorious countryside um, enjoyed by lots of people. And I'd really like to see some of that placemaking as it's called these days, you know, about having the money and ability really to do CPOs in terms of derelict buildings that blight a number of our communities and put them into beneficial use. And I'd actually like to say, because it's not often said that the cuts have not just affected the council, they've affected our partners, they've affected the voluntary and community sector. As we've been squeezed as a council, we've had to squeeze them. And I'm not just sad, I'm angry. I'm really, really angry that central government, the Conservative central government, have put local government in this position and have not actually kept their promises to, to see us see us right. Uh, they've broken those promises. Um, but we have to meet our statutory duties and we have to have a balanced budget. Um, and um, Chair, is it appropriate for me to turn to some of the detailed proposals in the paper at this point? Yes, yes that's fine. Thank you. Um, let me just start with 
um, the, the ones um, that particularly I've been asked to speak on this evening. Um, and the first of those is on in the report of 4.13 and relates to transport and particularly relates to school transport. It's partly a technical issue about where money comes from, but the, at its heart, we currently subsidise as a council 29 buses, school buses, and of course, during school terms, they're out and about every day at a total cost of 708,000. And the subsidy is meant for uh, people who are entitled, school students are entitled to free travel. Um, unfortunately, we have a number of students using those buses. In fact, I think there's at least one bus where nobody on that bus is entitled to free travel. And we are indeed subsidising uh, those school students. You'll see in 4.13 of the report uh, a number of options there in terms of asking officers to go away and to talk to the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and Metro about what um, the options are in relation to this. Um, and I have to say that I know that times are tough and are going to be very tough for a number of families. And I think with the caveat um, that we would want to see the lowest of those um, uh, options coming forward but we want to ask officers to fully investigate them the lowest option would give the council a 293,000 full year uh, saving which you can see would help tremendously in, in terms of filling that budget gap the consultation would be done through the west yorkshire combined authority and i understand that the other west yorkshire authorities um, are marching in step with us on this and they're also looking at these changes. So on 4.13 cabinet, I'm asking if you're happy to, for officers to go away and do further investigation and discuss things with West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And um, um, I've lost, lost my scribbled piece of paper there. Um, and to consult on our behalf, apologies. Um, the second one, if you're happy for me to go on, Chair, yes, is in relation to parking. Always a hot topic, whatever time of year. It's a hardy perennial. Um, and it may not surprise you to hear that we've had a very significant reduction in the total pay and display income from April to August. Well, of course we have. Income is running about 25% of the same period last year. And that's a shortfall of £837,000 so far. You can see that's a pretty, pretty big whack. And of course, the money that we get from parking is what we spend on the roads. It has to be hypothecated to expenditure on the roads. And that will reduce tremendously the amount of money we have to spend on dealing with potholes and so on in the roads uh, in the coming years. We're seeing a small amount of signs of recovery, but clearly, um, there are a number of pressures that will be ongoing. There aren't any actual proposals in 4.14 on parking, but the members are asked to note the budget pressure in this financial year and the challenges to the council's budget and the financial sustainability of the council in the coming year. <clears throat> and we will return to cabinet on this um, and particularly around the budget proposals for next year but I've got nothing further to add on 4.14 at this stage, Chair. I would like to go on, if I may then, to 4.17, which relates to public halls. Um, and this is where I'm going to use the, the, the phrase, the, the word for the first time, mothball, in terms of what do you reopen? Um, what do you keep closed? What do you look for other alternatives and what do you mothball until some of those alternatives might uh, might be possible in public halls um, clearly uh, there has been some difficulty in terms of financing those for some years they do wash their face they do cover their costs but the financial environment is becoming tougher and what the cuts have meant in the case of our public halls is that there has no, been no surplus to invest in bringing those up to scratch. 
to make them easier to let, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the proposals here are that Tomerden Town Hall, I can't remember whether it's one star or one star listed, but is an absolute jewel in the crown in terms of historic buildings. I think it's up there with, with Shibden. And of course, it's key in terms of the uh, Tomerden Towns Fund bid, and indeed I understand from the accelerated part of the Towns Fund bid that Tomerden Town Hall has already got some money from that. And it's proposed uh, that officers work on the proposals that it should be retained within the council's cultural assets. Position on Clay House, Brick House Civic Hall and Shelf Village Hall is actually at this moment less clear. And it's recommended that officers begin discussions with local communities and local voluntary organisations to see whether they might have an interest in keeping those on in terms of community use in different ways. However, unless community interest can be found, these buildings will remain closed, they will be mothballed. And ultimately, we may well come back to Cabinet and consider their sale. Which brings me on to further buildings, 4.18 in the report. Um, some slightly better news, perhaps. Um, Shipton Hall, you will know, reopened in August. It's closing shortly uh, to allow further filming of Gentleman Jack. Um, not an easy building to make COVID secure. Um, we have required people to pre-book tickets um, and we've obviously reduced the number of visitors that can have and people have to queue. So there will be a shortfall this year of income of about 120,000. And we will try and recover at least part of that through the government's income compensation scheme that members will remember that not all of those costs can be can be recovered. And indeed, there's a 5% volatility uh, calculation to be made on that as well, as well as the 75%. But we will certainly try our best to recover that income loss. Um, Bankfield Museum closed on the 20th of March. It's actually in some ways very different from Shibden Hall in that it's primarily about Calderdale. It's a museum for Calderdale. Um, and 60% of the visitors are actually Calderdale residents. It feels, it feels like ours. I don't know if you've been around it recently, but um, you do get people saying, oh, you know, I remember such and such a firm and so on. It does actually have the regimental museum in, in it, the Dukes. Um, it's got the Ackroydon collection, of course, and it's got fine textile and industrial heritage of Calderdale. Extraordinary what they've done with the um, costume museum in terms of having not just very interesting historic costumes, but ones which were actually made um, in Calderdale, made primarily in Halifax, but not just in Halifax. Um, so the service it is proposed will continue to make accessible the collections and the information relating to the history and the heritage. Could I just pause you for a moment, Councillor yes. Scullion, because Councillor Carter has asked to declare an interest, so I'll just allow her to do that. Thanks, Chair. I'm really sorry, Councillor Scullion, but, uh, but uh, the Regimental Museum was not mentioned in your report. However, you have mentioned it, so I need to declare an interest now at this point. I am a trustee of the Duke of Wellington's Regimental Museum, so I must declare that now at this, ish at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Thank you. And I know that that attracts people from, from around the country. Um, so the primary function of Bankfield is very much uh, to provide service on the heritage of Calderdale and its people. And we propose at the moment uh, that this should remain open. It had a record year last year um, and uh, the Gentleman Jack costume uh, exhibition certainly uh, certainly brought, brought in a few people. We're planning to reopen it in October. Um, and I don't know if people have been in recently, you can swipe your um, contactless card, your debit card and make a donation, a sort of plastic plinth thing in the corner. And we are going to be asking people for a donation, but clearly it is important to local people. We can't depend on that as a source of income. Um, and we will reintroduce the hire of rooms there when it's COVID safe to do so. 
we're doing the same um, in terms of the Smith Art Gallery. Um, for those of you who haven't been, it's in Brick House, and if you haven't been, that's shocking, and you should uh, and then correct that as, as soon as possible. They have had some great exhibitions there, and it's a very fine building and grounds. The final bit of the section on museums and galleries um, uh, regards Heptastore Museum. And those of you who've been there will know the size of the building would not make it economically viable to operate with the current social distancing guidance. Um, and we know that large events um, of different kinds and people crowding together, even the volunteers we've had who you know, talk about the, the Heptastall connections, not are likely to be allowed for some time. And in terms of consideration, we are recommending that Heptastall Museum does not open, reopen in the short term, that it's mothballed for the short term, and that we explore community interest in taking over the museum. And in, indeed, uh, the local parish council is a Heptastall parish council. But once again, we have to say, unless community interest is forthcoming, which we can take on the operation of the Heptastall Museum on a self-financing basis, then it will have to remain closed, um, certainly in the short term. And it may be that in the longer term, um, we have to keep that building closed. But those are, those are the positions on our museums and galleries. My final section of the paper before I hand over to Councillor Lynn um, is customer first. Now this is, this, is a, this is a tricky one. Officers have spent a long time thinking through the implications of this. Um, and the service was previously provided in Halifax at Westgate House, um, at, uh, sorry, at um, Horton Street, in Brighouse Civic Hall, in Tomerden Library, and also an appointment system at Hebden Ridge, Elland and Sorby Bridge. Demand at all of these points had gone down tremendously, particularly in the district centres. Um, and the figures are in the first paragraph of 4.19. Um, and numbers in Brick House in particular have reduced significantly since the closure of the Together Housing Office and the Job Centre. And universal support, universal credit support, is now being provided by the Citizen Advice Bureau. You'll remember that the council lost the contract um, from the DWP to, to the Citizen Advice Bureau, and they now pro formally provide that. Um, we have been exploring the use of hubs such as libraries and neighbourhood offices as a way, as a place. In some ways, I think what matters is the service, really. The signposting to the service and the quality of the service is a really important thing. Um, we think that much of it can be provided online and certainly the experience during um, the pandemic has been that much of that has actually been successfully provided online um, or by phone, by digital channels, etc. And as, as the um, as the paragraph in, in 419 says, um, uh, advisors, even on the telephone, use the trauma-informed practice methodology, which the police and others who work with vulnerable people do, where you often say to people, not what you want or what advice, but you say, what's happened to you? Tell me about it and try and establish what that person's needs, needs are. Um, we've got three advisors who specifically work for customer first dealing with homelessness prevention. We have a new uh, legal duty as a council, not only to work clearly with people who are homeless, but people who are in danger of becoming homeless, the homeless prevention service. And they've been working hard during this period and I expect actually there will be more demand. Um, we've done a lot of chatbot, digital assistant, our digital assistant Vera, and we've handled um, 13,000 exchanges with customers since the start of the pandemic. It's recommended that Horton Street remains permanently close to customers and staff, and that the team continue to work remotely using uh, the various channels, but also that in different localities, we do offer face-to-face -face support. We are very committed 
It's a much smaller number than it was, but we are very committed to providing face-to-face -face support for those customers who require it. Initially on an appointment basis through the central and the hub libraries for complex inquiries or to help customers or residents to actually use the, the free um, computers in the libraries where they don't have digital access and you can only access universal credit through, uh, through IT or indeed have limited skills, etc. cetera. Um, and we're also working with the Halifax Opportunities Trust um, in terms of advice through there and looking at the possibility of using 42 Market Street, which you'll know through their adult social care role um, of using that as one of the places where you might actually uh, get homelessness advice. That's initially. Once it is safe to do so, we're planning to scale that up to actually include drop in without appointment. So initially it'll be appointment and then drop in. And we're also talking with the DWP about having a presence in their Halifax office once they reopen more widely to the public. And we are talking also to CAB and other agencies and outlying locations, depending on the demand, but we will keep monitoring that. Um, so I think that's the end of that section. Really, officers exploring all the possibilities because we know that we have to have a multi-channel approach in terms of sporting residents with those needs. We need to be doing digital and computer, we need to be doing telephone, but we do actually, for a small number of people, still need to be doing face-to-face. -face. And we're trying to keep all of those channels going, but we're trying to do it in a way that's safe and meets, meets demand. We will have to keep it under review because I think everybody here in this meeting and people watching will know that at the end of furlough, we are expecting to see a number more people who will be going on to benefits for the first time or who'll be struggling with finances or indeed paying their rent. So we are keeping a very close eye on the demand here. I think that finishes my section of the detail of this report, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, Councillor Lynn, you want to touch on the other two sections? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I want to start, if I may, Chair, uh, leader with um, with my thank expressing my thanks to Councillor Susan Press. Um, she's worked really hard. Um, she's been totally committed to the anti-poverty agenda and to a lot of other elements of the work of this public services um, directorate. Um, and I just want to wish thank her um, sincerely and wish her all the very best um, for her recovery. And also, notwithstanding the political differences, because I'm as angry about Tory cuts and and and, and Tory Lou Dem cuts as anybody else, I'd like to thank Councillor Lee and Councillor Baker for their best wishes to me um, in this new role. And um, I will do my best. Um, right, on to the report. Um, it's my role to um, to look at um, First of all, I'd like what I'd like to do is to look at section 412 of the report, which deals with waste and recycling. Um, and as has already been um, said by colleagues, um, this is these are services which everybody uses really, with, with, sort of with pretty much without exception. Um, and it, it is a key it is a key part of, of we are statutorily required. Um, to, to undertake um, certain elements of this work anyway. Um, but there, are, there is an element of um, flexibility about how much of that service we provide. Um, and as it says in the report, you'll see that, and it will be the same when we come on to libraries, that so far, over the last 10 years of the austerity, we have managed to sustain much higher levels of provision than has been the case generally across the country, particularly across the North Indian. Um, but we are just about running out the end of the road, really, in terms of what's happening with austerity. So, so what I'm going to do just briefly now is run through what some of the um, some of the options are, which which um, we've been looking at, uh, which the public services director has been looking at. And the first of them um, is um, to reduce the number of our household waste recycling centres. Um, that it's mentioned in the report that if we were to close to that would say £200,000 per annum, it's estimated. Nobody wants to do that. 
nobody necessarily thinks it's a good idea. There are a lot of considerations that we need to think about that. Um, not the least of which I have to say, from, uh, from my perspective, is um, the extent to which we are able to sustain um, uh, a, a good um, service to residents um, for bulky waste, um, bulky waste collection. Um, which had to be suspended during the, the pandemic, but is now, I'm pleased to say, back online, as it were. So the first option was, were, that was being considered, which is a very hard thing, is are we able to sustain all five of our um, household waste recycling centres, or should we actually consider reducing them by one or two? In other words, that would involve, presumably, um, looking at retaining... Um, uh, retaining household waste recycling centres in, the in three different areas within the borough, Upper Valley, Lower Valley and, um, and Halifax. But option two looks at an alternative to that really, which is could we perhaps save money by reducing the opening hours at these centres? Um, uh, perhaps by that might involve restricting, um, restricting opening to the days um, when there is relatively high usage and perhaps reducing it on days when there's relatively low usage um, or perhaps reducing the length of days so that perhaps we might be opening um, the centres um, for the same sort of hourly, uh, the same sort of hours that we open them in the winter that, that might pertain through the summer and so on. So that's the second option. The third option, which is a, is a really hard one to think to even contemplate, but is one which I have to say a number of other local authorities have, have um, moved to, is to move to a three-weekly refuse collection. Um, at the moment, we have a fortnightly refuse collection. We could, it's estimated, save up to £400,000 per annum if we did this. But I'm also very conscious that that's, that's kind of tough, and it's quite tough particularly on um, households that might live in, um, in homes with very restricted space outside, perhaps only a little, a little front yard. I know that's certainly the case in my own ward in Parkwood for, for many people and many other parts of the, uh, of, of the, the borough too. The fourth option um, is one which actually probably uh, affects uh, probably about 2,000 of our residents, which is important. Um, and that is, at the moment, there are residents who live in quite rural um, areas where it's really impossible to get um, to get the normal refuse collection vehicle um, along to them. And so we we actually currently have um, a Land Rover type vehicles that, that undertake the, those pickups and so on. Um, and there is consideration. The fourth option considers whether actually. With the exception of people who are entitled to assisted collections, which we would want to sustain, perhaps because they certainly wouldn't be um, in a position um, to be manhandling rubbish or anything like that, um, whether we might consider that as, a, as an option and ask um, people in rural, those rural locations to take their rubbish to the, um, to the end of the lane where they live. Um, again, it's not a palatable option. It's not one we want to go for. But it's there because these are the sorts of things that we have no alternative but to consider. And finally, um, and I feel fairly sure that this is that some of my my fellow uh, cabinet members will, uh, will will not be very happy with this one. There's the question about recycling. Um, we've taken the lead in Calderdale, and I'm very proud that we've taken the lead in Calderdale in having weekly recycling um, collections. Um, I think it's fantastic. I think um, that we need to do more of it. Um, and uh, the, the amount of plastic bottles that I pick up from Wally Road, which ought to have been in somebody's recycle bin instead of littering the road, is nobody's business. But nevertheless, re recycling at the moment, we collect weekly. And again, it has been estimated that if we were to move to a fortnightly recycling collection, that could save in excess of £300,000 per annum. So those are five options that have been put forward and for consideration. Um, there's clearly a, a considerable amount of, of, of work that would need to be done. Um, and it goes without saying with all of these options, and I'm sure this will be brought out in the, uh, in the conclusion recommendations, that all of the, it's, it's mentioned in the report, that all of these options would be subject 
um, to consultation and, and obviously quality impact assessments and, and, and so on and so forth. The second area I want to uh, section of the report, which um, I need to um, draw to your attention, is section 416, um, which is our libraries. Um, we've done really well, and I can re we've done really well to retain the density of libraries that we've had, that we have in this area. And just as I've been immensely proud that we've been able to retain our children's centres that cater for some of the most vulnerable children and families in the borough. I've also been extremely proud of the fact that despite the austerity and despite the cuts in central government funding for local government, we've managed up until now to hang on to the, we've got the highest density, the most libraries per head of the population in the whole region. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid, unless the government cavalry rides over the hill to the rescue, we're not going to be able to continue that. Um, and so, as you know, uh, libraries had to be closed um, in, the, in the actual lockdown section of dealing with the pandemic. Um, and eventually what we were able to do, and that was wonderful, was to, um, to reopen the wonderful Halifax Central Library. I can't believe I've been on the council so long that I can remember being in the council when we had the debate about whether we didn't want a new library. Um, and lots of people were really keen that we shouldn't have a new library. And now what we've got is a wonderful sixth form college and a new library. And so obviously that new library in Halifax, which does after all serve um, a, you know, a town of over 100,000 people, that's there and that, that is obviously going to be retained. But the proposal is also to retain six, our six hub libraries. And those are detailed in the, in the report. And they include the relatively new King Cross Library, um, but other libraries um, in, 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 in Brickhouse and so on. Um, and, and of course, Ellen, which is currently closed at the moment um, because of, um, because of refurbishments. So our hub libraries that we'll be looking at, at retaining, um, in addition to our new Brighouse, Hebden Bridge, Selby Bridge, Todmorden, and as I say, I've already mentioned King Cross. But there are another 13 community libraries um, right across right across the board. Um, and the what what is set out in the report, and it does need further consideration, particularly because in some instances um, it might be local community organizations, parish councils, key partners, voluntary groups may want to come forward with ideas for alternative uses for those buildings. Um, so there was some further consideration will be needed um, of, of these, these proposals. But the proposal at the moment, and they're set out in detail, and I won't go through them um, uh, leader in, 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 in every single one, but the proposal is to reduce um, the number of community libraries from 13 to seven. And the principles that we want to think about in relation to that, there's a number of principles. But one of them is that we would like to try, if at all possible, to retain community libraries in areas of high deprivation, where for families and children having access to a library um, in their neighbourhood can really enhance their educational opportunities. And the second, of course, is to think about how far are people actually going to have to travel if we close their library. Um, there are some libraries um, uh, you know, where, in fact, and it's detailed in the report, where you're talking about asking people to go perhaps another mile or a mile and a half from where they, are, they already are. Um, and I think the, the other point to say here um, is also to, um, to remember that in some cases, um, we, even before we came to this, we were having to look at what, um, what further capital investment would be required if we were to bring these libraries up to, up to standard. And by that time, in some cases, it's things like making them fully accessible for all, for, for all our citizens, regardless of, of, of disability, if you've got steps and so on and so forth. So, um, so those are the sort of considerations that we have to think about. But I think I'd just like to close by, by, say, by reminding us that actually, as, as um, Councillor Scullion mentioned in her presentation about customer first, the role of libraries is changing. Um, 
And um, one of the things that I know from my you know, casework and so on in my own ward is that there is still a need for, in some instances for some people for, um, you know, for face to face, albeit socially distanced, for, for, for actually um, appointments um, to be held with officers for advice and so on. Um, and I look forward to, the, to seeing whether our hub libraries, um, as well as um, you know, possibly other, other community venues, uh, may very well be able to play a role in that. So I think that's, that's all I want to say at this stage, um, uh, Linda, and I'd be very happy to do my best to answer questions, but I hope people will bear with me that um, I've not had very long to get my head around this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Council Lynn. I don't have any other cabinet members want to speak at the moment. I do have a list of seven non-cabinet members who've asked to speak. I will try to take you all in um, in the order I saw in the chat. I am aware one or two I think did indicate prior to the meeting, so I apologise if I've if I've forgotten that. But I'm I'm going to have to stick to the order in the chat. So I'm um, I'm going to start off with Councillor Bellinger. Thank you, Chair. Really appreciate that. Um, and to be quite honest, well done for the uh, scripted political point scoring as a distraction against the poor decision making that we usually see. Um, I didn't hope it didn't go political this evening, but unfortunately it did. As, uh, as a Collardale councillor, I, mean, I fully understand the current situation which we are facing financially and therefore fully support making some of the savings where we have to. Um, However, you know, I find it hard to support some of the savings cuts that have a, a detrimental impact onto the residents of, of my ward and of, of Collardale in that matter, especially if the savings reduce the efficiency of a service where we have strived to improve over the centuries, and that's the disposal of waste. So... I have a number of points here that I want to sort of like ask. I mean, I can, I'm happy to leave them with you and have a written response to them. Um, and that's on the, on the household waste recycling centres. If we were to permanently close these, three of these, two or three of these, we will clearly see an, an environmental impact on, on with fly tipping, which we saw recently when the uh, recycling centres were closed. So my first point here is, have cabinet and officers actually studied the cost and figures from when the recycling centres were previously closed? And has this financial impact been taken into account? And if so, has this been offset against the £200,000 savings suggested? Two, how will this affect our contractual agreement with Suez? As we will be actually breaking the contract or changing the contract could they quite easily walk away from it themselves? Because at the end of the day, they're going to be making a loss of over a million pounds. It's a lot of money to them. And three, has the option of bringing this service back in house being explored? So I'm sure with regards, the changes in the opening hours would be more welcomed by residents of Calderdale and possibly even a closure on certain days split between the sites, which has been suggested, I'm sure that will be probably more welcome than, than closing some of the sites permanently. At least then we have coverage over, you know, the whole of Calderdale. With regards to the, the, the household recycling, um, if the changes proposed were to go ahead, what consideration has been given to <laughs> the increase in weight of the containers that the that the sewage staff have to pick up and lift and take to the vehicle because these containers are now going to be even fuller than what they are before. I mean, fair enough, some are full already, but they're going to be moving more. Two, you know, the possible increase in vermin as well caused by bags of waste that are, are unable to fit in the in the refuge containers, you know, and left on the streets. I mean, we've seen this already uh, recently where you know, we've had quite a number of missed collections and, and it's cats and dogs that are out there that stray that break into the bags and then there's food waste over the floors, which then obviously attracts vermin. So with this in mind, are we going to introduce or increase our pest control team? Again, an extra cost to this. Um, three, the downtime on rounds as well. Has this been taken into consideration? 
because the vehicles can only take so much. Once they're full, they have to go back and unload and come back out again. So if they're doing this more often, there's going to be more downtime. And this is going to be exacerbated more during busy periods like Christmas and bank holidays. Four, what assurance can be given that if a missed collection takes place, they will be collected the following day and not on the next collection date because that will then lead, you know, meet it like six weeks before a, another collection. And then five, the increase of our safe clean and cleaner team to cope with the extra detritus that will accumulate in our neighbourhoods that's been blown out of the containers because the containers are, are full. Now, moving on to my last bit here, which is the end of lane collections. Quite a number, obviously where I live, it's quite semi-rural. Now, quite a number of properties that are about a quarter of a mile away from the nearest roadside. So are we actually expecting our residents to walk a quarter of a mile or even up to half a mile in some cases with their refuse containers, uh, you know, to make it easier for us? And does our insurance policy cover any accidents or injuries to residents that are actually taking these containers half a mile down the track so, we, so it's easier for us to, to pick up? What I would like is some reassurance that these aspects have been taken into consideration. Um, but I'd also like to find out how our officers have actually derived at some of these figures. How are they actually broken down? I'd like to see a breakdown of how they've how they've got to these figures rather than it's going to be 200,000 here and 150,000 there. It'd be nice to see them actually broken down. And one of the things that you, you know, that's been said tonight is that as a Liberal Democrat group, we're not very forthcoming with, with ideas. But unfortunately, you know, <laughs> myself and the Conservatives through such a performance, we've pushed the commercialisation team. We've supported the commercialisation within the, the authority and we actually came to Cabinet with our report on commercialisation, improving that. Um, planning enforcement, we're weak in that area as well. We could be generating more income there if our planning enforcement was improved. Um, today, I've only found out that there's a considerable amount of costs to us from Network Rail and the Canal and River Trust whenever we do any work in those areas. So these are other areas that's worth exploring to actually make savings. So really, I take a little bit of umbrage saying that we don't really support making savings because we do at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, you know, we tend to look outside of the box, not like the Labour in Coldwell, which put parking charges up, increase council tax, and look at ways of making cuts to, to services. So thank you, Chair, for your time and giving me the opportunity to speak on this. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure on the commercialisation, we'd love to see some more actually costed proposals because I think that's been markedly lacking, frankly, in what's come forward from the scrutiny panel. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how stronger planning enforcement is going to generate income. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly look forward to seeing some more detail on your ideas on that one, Councillor Bellinger. On, on the waste things, I think as Councillor Lynn set out, you know, the intention here is really to identify areas where we're authorising officers to enter into detailed discussions with, um, you know, with, with the contractors, because we're well aware all of these require contractual arrangements, and it is about working out the best and most effective package that will reduce costs whilst maximising recycling and, and minimising those disbenefits. But um, I'll, I'll perhaps let other cabinet members come back on some of those points later on in this, rather than everybody respond to every point. Um, Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, back at the September council meeting, um, I asked if there'd be consultation around any cuts that were needed, and I expressed concerns about the cuts local councils across the country we're facing. Uh, you replied to my question and said, in the current year, the head of finance is advising that the action being taken by directors on existing saving plans and the anticipated government compensation for lost income meant that an emergency budget or a package of saving cuts may be avoided. So we were not under an understanding that you were going to be bringing forward either an emergency budget or a package of savings cuts. So that directly contradicts what Councillor Wilkinson said for everyone knew that we we're going to have to be making cuts because this came as a surprise to us it also came as a surprise because 
it wasn't on the cabinet key decision list. So normally a key decision like this is a decision that affects um, services across more than two wards or a cut of more than £200,000. And we'd expect that to be on the key decision list and we'd expect uh, that to be published in advance. So we only actually found out about this a few days before this cabinet meeting took place. And uh, what it means is that no councillor across the council, other than those on the cabinet, are actually going to get to vote on any of these proposals or even have a mechanism where we can put forward alternative uh, saving suggestions. So I'd actually what I call on you is to bring this, withdraw the paper tonight, bring it back to a full council meeting where opposition groups can actually put forward alternatives and go through something like we have with the normal uh, budget procedure every year where people do actually make amendments and in the past we have made amendments and, and on occasions those amendments have been accepted by by the Labour group. Um, the actual wording of your recommendation in the paper tonight says that you're going to ex accept the recommendations contained within it and delegate powers to officers to make these cuts so it's unclear whether you're asking them just to go away and thinking about this but the wording of the recommendation says you're actually going to make you're going to give them the power to make these cuts so are you making the cuts tonight or are you not? And if you're not making any cuts tonight, will it come back to a future cabinet meeting or a future council meeting to make the decision? Um, unfortunately, as, as we go into this, there's some other things. I mean, elsewhere in the paper, it says um, 4.2 of the report says the report provides an update on the progress of the reviews and makes recommendations about more immediate changes. So it's again, it's suggestion that the recommendations here are about immediate changes rather than just delegating powers to an officer to go away and consider it. So are these immediate cuts and changes you're making tonight? If so, why wasn't it a key decision? Why did opposition groups only find out about this with a, with a week's notice? Some of the proposals contained within it are obviously uh, hugely unpopular. We, we launched a petition uh, against the changes to the waste collection service. We've already had over 2,200 people uh, sign that position and many people are, will essentially be horrified at the idea of having to go to, to free weekly collections and the drop in the recycling service. So we'd very much like an opportunity to have a proper emergency budget and have an opportunity to put forward some alternative savings. We do recognize that, you know, the cuts are something that all local councils are facing. We have another petition on our website calling on the government to provide more funding for local authorities. I'm pleased that over 500 people have signed that. However, both Councillor Dacri and Councillor Lynn said that you have maintained a high level of services going forward. So it seems if you've maintained a high level of services in the past, it seems a bit rich to then blame it on cuts that the Lib Dems were involved in that ended in 2015. You know, actually, the cuts that the coalition government made were less than the cuts that have been proposed in the 2010 Labour manifesto. I do accept that the continued cuts by the Conservative majority government that's gone on from 2015 are now going too far and they are cut into the bone and we are absolutely opposed to those continued cuts by government. But we have put forward alternative suggestions and we would like a mechanism to doing so. That's why in the September council meeting, I'll repeat, we asked you if you were going to make cuts and you said they wouldn't be necessary. So now you're suddenly saying that cuts are necessary and we should have known they're necessary all along. That just, just doesn't make any sense. The final point I'd like to make is over the past few days, I have been campaigning on this on social media. I've been campaigning on this because I'm absolutely passionate about protecting the public services that, that matter to people. Unfortunately, I have faced an absolute torrent of personal abuse. And I'm afraid to say that personal abuse has largely come from supporters of the Labour Party. What saddens me, though, is actually that two, uh, I, one of your members of your cabinet has, has joined in on this abuse. One of the comments made against me said that I was a sad man, an attention whore, and a very pathetic politician. Language that is completely unacceptable in political debate. We can argue about the points, we can argue about the politics, but we don't have to go to that level of personal insult. That comment was liked and endorsed by Councillor Scott Patient, one of your cabinet members. So is this something you stand for as leader of the cabinet? Do you, do you endorse members of your cabinet supporting cyberbullying like that? Thank you, Councillor Baker. I find a lot of uh, individual comments on so on social media quite quite difficult personally, and increasingly uh, tend to distance myself from using social media. I'll let Councillor Patient comment for himself if he if he chooses to do so. You, uh, in referring to my answer at um, at Council, 
I think two points I would make. Firstly, I said may not be necessary. An emergency budget may not be necessary. Other options might be. In terms of knowing that further papers were coming, I refer back to the three, the three papers at the September cabinet meeting, which clearly set out the work that was planned on the future on future council and said that proposals would be coming, would be coming forward. You know, I would ask for would recognize on all sides that um, we are working in a financial position um, that is that is rapidly changing, where we're still trying to get greater clarity both about the future costs and the future impact, and we need to keep responding to that. The issue of whether or not this paper should have been a key decision, you've already raised that issue with the council's legal officer, he's given you his response on that and advice that the process being followed here is perfectly proper and right. What I will say and will clarify when we come to the um, decisions further on is that um, you know, I, don't, I will be slightly modifying the, the recommendations to make a, a little bit clearer um which of these items i would expect to be coming back to cabinet for uh for 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 further decision making now colleagues anybody anyone else want to to comment at this point or wait till uh, we're we're further on yeah councillor patient yeah thank you leader um i guess i'd just like to come back a little bit on councillor baker's um assumption that i'm um in any way um, harboring abuse against him. Um, it, one of his um, co-group um, associates got in touch with me today and we had a frank discussion about what, what that happened. Um, there, there was a debate online um, and I've already said about um, that, 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 you know, I maybe inadvertently liked one of the comments that was there, but I, I can't see whether that, that is or isn't true because the comment seems to have been deleted by the original poster. I will say this, that um, Councillor Baker often likes to um, participate in a um, robust political debate, of, often quite disingenuous. And um, I, think, I think that um, that challenge sometimes comes from all corners. And I think we are, we are in a p political reality. I think we are, we are in a situation whereby we, we, are, we are still in a precarious position because of 10 years of austerity. And there needs to be an amount of responsibility attached to that. So, like I said, I don't want to go too far into this. It's just going to be a bit of a to and fro. But suffice to say, this issue's already been settled. So I feel that's the end of it. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to bring in more at this point, Councillor Wilkinson, because I think um, I do want to make sure everybody gets a chance to comment. But I will give you an opportunity to comment at some point further on, if that's if that's okay. Um, Councillor Robinson. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, may I first of all state how, how disappointed I am. Um, this, this debate has been absolutely toxic. I've been absolutely appalled uh, at what's been going on in this meeting. And is this what it actually takes for the youngest councillor in Calderdale to tell you all to grow up, to tell you all to get a grip? I'm absolutely disgusted about what's, what's been going on in this meeting. Um, I'm absolutely appalled, but but anyway, aside from that, on to my submission. Uh, question number one, uh, Council Lynn states that the council uh, are trying to retain libraries in areas of high deprivation. Um, I would argue that this approach should also be considered alongside age demographics. Uh, my ward has a high elderly population and they will be affected by the closure of, of Hip Home Library. They use the library, and let's not be forget. But let's not forget after the after the pandemic, um, we need to reintegrate our elderly back into their communities. Their mental well-being has been shot at as a result of isolate, social isolation. So I would ask you to reconsider this report uh, and acknowledge the effect that this will have on our elderly population. Uh, question two regarding uh, Hip Home Library's closure. I would argue that this is absolutely unfair. Um, I was only discussing Bailey Bridge Library with you, I think it was last month, uh, that was closed obviously about two years ago, and it seems like my ward is being unfairly prejudiced by these actions. Um, a point on this point, uh, closing the six libraries would generate a £150,000 saving. I'm guessing much of this saving relates to staffing costs. 
Uh, Councillor Scullion addressed mothballing, but not in, in relation to the point of libraries. Therefore, why can't the, art, the council mothball all six libraries, um, make the redundancies, which will allow the council to realise the £150,000 cost saving and reopen them after the shortfall is mitigated and after the pandemic has ceased? This would save our libraries. It would um, allow us to keep our libraries in the long term and would also mitigate the effects on our elderly and reintroduce them back into the community. Uh, question number three relates to money. It's all about money. Um, so let's talk about some figures. Um, in 2019, the council spent £1.75 million on Ellen Library. Uh, the Square Chapel has received £80,000 a year from the council. Uh, then he went into administration, uh, but it's good news that it's being reformed. And the Peace Hall, this is all public information available on the Charities Commission, um, has been funded £3.5 million loan and £2.75 million in revenue support. This has placed a historic impact on the council's reserves. And these reserves are intended to have been used in situations like these. There has been funding available. It's not about spending difficulties, it's about spending choices. Therefore, Leader, may I ask you, because charity begins at home, to undergo a review, an immediate review of partnership funding and third sector funding. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Um, I, as we go through both the future council process and next year's budget process, I very much doubt if there are any areas of the council's budget that will not be considered, including all elements of partnership funding. Of course, in some cases, um, council has entered into agreements of various kinds and you need to look at the terms in, in, in terms of whether you can vary them and what the implications would, would be for that. Um, but I, I'd repeat, I don't, I don't think there is any areas of the council's budget that isn't going to get examined over the weeks and months ahead. Um, I don't know, Councillor Scullion or Councillor Dacre, whether you want to, to comment at all about the re reserves position? Uh, yeah, Councillor yeah, Sorry? I, I can comment. Councillor Dacre, uh, yeah. Yes, we are in a position where we have no more reserves left to use. But what I would say is that we use those reserves because we were trying to maintain services at what have been quite high levels for our area over the last few years. Other councils adopted different approaches. They may still have their reserves, but they don't have many libraries and they have three weekly waste um, collections. So, it, it, and they, other, other councils have engaged in more commercial investment opportunities in order to try to make money. All councils have had to struggle one way or another with the fact that their budgets were being cut back brutally. They've adopted different approaches, but they've all had to make do things that they wouldn't necessarily have wanted to do. In our case, it was we've used reserves. Other, as I say, other people have taken different choices. So it doesn't alter the underlying problems that we just no longer have enough money to run services in the way in which we're doing and it is not simply it, we've run out of choices now uh, as have nearly all councils sorry yeah, councillor robinson um i mean we, we we will pick up as we move forward you put some of the other points about the libraries i think the mothballing question i mean yeah i mean councillor scullion referred to that specifically in terms of public halls I think if yeah if services are being withdrawn from particular buildings, the question of the future of those buildings then comes up, and and there's a wider discussion perhaps about um, retaining against the potential of reopening, which also looks at the issues and conditions and what's elsewhere. I mean, it's um, you know it's an interesting power, you know. Um, Sometimes that can have quite a long time off. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about the Calderdale Industrial Museum, I think that was closed for something like 10 years, possibly more. 
um, before a group of volunteers saw the opportunity to, to reopen it and actually have done so very successfully. So sometimes that is an option, but of course, sometimes it may be that um, holding onto a building which is not in use and is deteriorating obviously can also carry its own risks and costs. So I don't think there's any one simple answer, but I, I understand the point you're making about that. Um, Councillor Mrs Carter. Thank you, Leader. Um, can I just start by saying that um, well, Councillor Wilkinson indicated that um, he thought that um, me as a, a backbench Tory councillor might have a little bit of an impact on a, on a government. Um, I really need to tell him that at this level, um, you don't have any impact. And I think I've, he'll find that he doesn't have any impact on the leadership of the Labour Party uh, and the Labour, the Labour opposition. Um, much as I would like to do, I'm afraid I haven't, um, and, and maybe uh, that might be a different story if I had got some impact, but uh, unfortunately I haven't, and I don't really want to get into all the, the politics of all this, because um, anything that goes through, through government has to have majority support, and it isn't always necessarily uh, full um, one government support, there is a lot of opposition support to a lot of the measures that are taken, so I think unless you look through Hansard and look at everything, then it's in, in detail. One can't really tell whether it's just purely this government or whether it is a combined effort and a consensus across the piece. Um, so getting away from the politics, because I don't think that is helpful to any of us in, uh, within, this, within this report. Can I just say I am really disappointed that um, this report is being considered uh, as it is. Under budget rules, um, there is a full public consultation. But if I have read, um, 3.2 correctly, um, it is indicating there that there will only be a consultation with service users and um, as uh, every single uh, council taxpayer and household in this borough is a service user of some of these items, I am fully aware that that is not what that little bit means. So I would like some clarity over which areas are looking at being service users, being asked to um, uh, have an input into and what has been consulted upon and I am quite concerned that it is going to be an officer delegation. I think some of these decisions, some of these proposals should really go to members. I think they should have been part of the budget proposal. Whilst I, I admit that they need to be put in place urgently if, if the Labour group consider or the Labour cabinet consider these to be important with regards to balanced budgets, the impact for this current financial year is minimal. However, I do understand that that would cut out the consultation period in the in next year and therefore savings will be for a full year's impact. I just feel that doing it this way around is, is quite a bit disingenuous to the public out there that pay their council tax so that they don't have an input because full consultation of a budget proposal means that every single member of the public out there in the community can, can have an in, input into it. So I am a bit disappointed, I have to say. Um, looking at this, it's going to have a, quite an impact. Some of the things on here are going to have quite an impact in my ward. Um, if we go through the report as it starts on, on recycling and the waste and recycling element of it, with regards to the Household Waste Centre at Soberbridge, um, it is nearest the nearest one to my ward. Obviously, Soberbridge is not in my ward, but this is the nearest one. Um, I think there is a, quite a lack of understanding about how people um, use recycling centres, because I don't think it is just about recycling in some instances, it is just about um, general waste. I, do, I also have, have a, an issue over, over the recycling centres that, uh, that we're looking at maybe to close. The Councillor Lynn did mention Soberbridge and Ellen yet again, they've been part of the, the longest closure issues uh, in, in the lockdown uh, times. Um, you know, none of our, recycling centres are fully DDA compliant. The one that is nearest to being DDA compliant is Elland, because all the skips are accessible apart from two small steps, one from the car park onto the pavement and one from the Cape pavement onto the gantry. Um, Sobe Bridge has some of their, uh, some of the things that have got the compactor and some of the other things are DDA compliant, except that the compact is not okay if you like me and you're only four foot 11 and a bit, although I've shrunk a bit over the years, I'm about four foot 10 now, because that compactor means that I can't all throw stuff into it because it's too high up for me to manage. Um, but that 
comes the next nearest. The rest, none of them are DDA compliant in any way, shape or form, because all the skips require you to walk up steps to go on the gantry to throw things in. And at this current moment in time, the, the operatives at the sites are not allowed to help the public. So anybody elderly or anybody that has any DDA issues, um, well, forget it, because it's not happening. Um, public services should be about providing the best, the best for, for the public, um, not about the worst. So I think our recycling centres need a big look at as well to, to make sure they are DDA compliant. Um, but with regards to the Sober Bridge one for my ward, um, it has a big impact, does this. Topography means in my ward that there is a significant number of people that are on waste, waste sack collections, not on wheelie bins. Um, I can assure you, two weekly collections is not easy when you're on sacks, where you store it, in a rural area, adjacent to a river, and everybody knows that there is a rat within uh, spitting distance of a river, um, but not just them. Uh, there's also the element of, of uh, as we mentioned, dogs and cats. They are the least of my worries. The foxes are a big issue because obviously in a rural area, you do have a, a large significant number of foxes. The only way I've been able to manage over the years without a resack, without a wheelie bin, and being on sack collection was to actually take some of my refuse to the uh, to Sobey Bridge Tip, to the recycling centre. I also have an open fire. Um, it's a bit difficult when you're trying to get rid of ashes in among everything else and you've only got two sacks or you can't really store any more than two sacks. To go on to a three weekly collection will be an absolute nightmare for people that are on sack collection. In addition to that, you're talking about reducing the, and, and, and the bit about the end of lane collections. Really, are we serious with end of lane collections? Do we really take that seriously? We have a big issue at the minute with every single person who puts things out on the pavement for collection the night before when the, when the, when the, people, when the bin men are coming the following morning, especially if the wind blows because it's all over the place anyway. Are we really serious that we want people to put things at the end of their lane in rural areas where there is livestock and vermin? I really can't believe that that is a serious way forward. I really cannot, irrespective of the DDA issues. So that in itself is going to be a big problem to us uh, in my ward. And I guess some of the people in my ward do use Elland Recycling Centre uh, because of its ease, its ease and comfort. And, and it doesn't have the same issues about going up and down steps. And of course, if you live in Barkisland, it's as easy to go to Elland as it is to go to Sobey Bridge. So I have, I have quite a significant concern about the recycling centres and the proposals that are being put there. With regards to transport, I mean, as, as you may well imagine, transport is a big issue for me with regards to the, the young people in my ward trying to get to school in the morning, because if they were dependent on public transport, they'd never get there. And that is an issue every year when we're looking at whether they're entitled to go on the school buses or not, uh, when they live within a certain distance, because the only bus that they can catch leaves written in at if they leave, if they catch the bus that leaves Rittenden at the, the best time, which is around 10 past eight, they can't get connection in Sobey Bridge because of the traffic build up backwards and forwards to get them to school on time because school starts at quarter to nine. And as I think you're all aware, I think most of you have been school governors in the past. Uh, lateness has a big, big impact on the dashboard system for schools, which is something that we don't want to see. And in some cases, uh, there is no public transport at all that would serve the children in my ward. And in other cases, they will be leaving home at 10 to seven to get a four mile trip. And I don't know where they'd go for an hour between getting to Sobey Bridge and getting to Sobey Bridge High, it would be virtually impossible. But those are another issue. I think there needs to be a little bit more thought put into how school buses are operated and what they're operated for and what young people need to get them to school on time. Libraries, libraries, you know, it's funny, isn't it? I have a ward of 44 square miles. Ryburn Ward is 44 square miles. Quite a lot when you consider that the whole of Calderdale is only 104. It's quite a significant chunk, square mileage. And, you know, in, in Ryburn Ward, we have one, 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 one Calderdale Council public service facility. And that is a part-time library in Rippenden. And even that is now under threat. 
Whilst I can go along with the recommendation to continue to explore the links and usage together with the, the parish council, in order to retain, it does state in order to retain the library. So for whatever reason, if those links are not possible due to costs, and bearing in mind that the Calderdale Council taxpayer and the Ryburn Council taxpayer already pays towards the library provision, it would mean paying an additional added uh, amount of tax to the to Ripton Parish Council so that they did have a revenue budget to be able to maintain it. That part-time library, which is the only thing that this council provides as a public service building or whatever outside waste collection is disappearing. And I find that really, really sad. I also, Councillor Lynn, I'm really sorry, but I do not think that libraries should be just for the deprived. I think library, I think everybody has a certain level of deprivation. And I think elderly people also need to be considered in among this. And it's not just about your perception of deprivation. There's a lot of deprivation out there, which is hidden deprivation that we need to be considering. As I said at the beginning, I was very disappointed that this report had come in this fashion. Um, I do not believe that we should be doing what is in effect budget proposals in this fashion partway through the year. And I think it should be a very open and transparent process that every single town council taxpayer in this borough can have an impact on, can respond if they so wish. And I don't think it should be just down to I definitely don't think it should be an officer decision as to whether things are, are maintained or whether they are changed. Well, thank you for your patience and for listening to me. Um, and I look forward to the responses. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Um, Councillor Lynn, is there anything you want to... Oh, I think, actually, I think it was Councillor Staker, were you indicating? Oh. Um, yes, I can do. Uh, Councillor Lynn may wish to respond as well, but... Yes, we accept that this is, it's, un, we don't want to be doing this at all. And, but we have to, and unfortunately, we have to do it very quickly because we still have an overspending this year. And as Councillor Carter herself noted, if we don't start now, we're not going to make the full savings for next year. So regrettably, we just feel that we have no choice but to bring these uh, items forward at this time. In terms of consultation with service users, I think, yes, I think perhaps we need to give you a written answer on that because that's not going to be the same in all cases uh, as to how that would work, how consultation would work. Um, in terms of household waste recycling centres and the amount of waste that goes through them and so on and so forth, one of the things we're wanting to do when we look at all of this is reflect on how people are using household waste recycling centres because there's an awful lot of recycling does go through them, which it would appear at first sight could simply be recycled on the doorstep. And we need to know why people aren't recycling it on the doorstep, but are driving to a recycling centre instead. Um, but when we are talking about sites, it, we have to remember that they're only any good for people who can drive a vehicle. They're of no use to pedestrians who, I mean, in York, where my parents live, you're not even allowed in one as a pedestrian. I don't know whether Colverdale allows people in, but people don't go as pedestrians. So they don't provide any form of service for that minority of people who are usually the deprived people who don't have vehicles. Um, in terms of DDA compliance, I don't know what the rules are. And again, we'd have to come back to you, I think, in writing on the rules on, on that in relation to waste sites. But... Um, the danger is that if we were to start making um, improvements that made them DDE compliant, we have no money with which to do that. And the upshot of that, I speculate, could be that you ended up shutting them because they weren't um, compliant. So again, I think we'd have to respond in writing fully to that. Um, we recognise that with things like end of lane, if we end end of lane connections, there are going to be issues for people, but these are issues which we'd be calling on people to be adaptable to and to be resilient and deal with some of these issues because all of us are going to have to be dealing with difficult issues and difficulties in relation to cuts that are coming over the next year. Um, and just lastly, in relation, to, well, in transport, we're not suggesting that we would take that transport away. We're suggesting that we would make the lowest recommended 
increase in the cost to the people who are using that bus who are not entitled to free transport. And in re relation to Rippenden Library, I appreciate that you say it's your only Calderdale service, but on the figures that we were given last year, it, it appeared that it got a total of 1,900 visits, which would suggest that it is far less used than the majority than many of our libraries, and that is not perhaps valued by some of the Rippenden uh, of the Ryburn residents uh, as Councillor Carter might have hoped. Thank you, Castle Deck. Castle Lynn, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Yes, I'd just like to come back on that, and and thanks everybody for the for their comments. So, um, I think that th th there were a couple of things that kind of stood out for me. One was, um, I think both Councillor Robinson and Councillor Carter drew attention to the need to remember the uh, the impact of libraries and the importance of libraries, particular to, particularly to older people within the community. And I think that's I think that's a fair. Um, uh, that's a fair comment um, to, to draw attention to. Um, I mean, we are, one of the things I think, and I think there is, a, you know, a passing reference to it in the report, which is about the actual mobile library service and the extent to which that has been of help to some people um, during the, uh, you know, during the, the pandemic, during the shutdown, and so on. But that's certainly something that I'll take away, and we and when we are looking at this, I think it needs, I think that, that certainly needs to be considered. Um, so thank you for raising that. Um, the, uh, as, as Councillor Dacre said, I, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on, on the issue about um, the DDA compliance, but the, the examples that you gave of having to, how on earth are you supposed to get up onto a gantry to throw things down? And I mean, to me, that, that is also an issue about the point at which that the regulations might permit us to ask our operatives at the household waste centres to help people with their rubbish who need help. Um, but I don't know what the, I don't know what the current regulations say about that. We have responsibilities as uh, health and safety responsibilities to our employees, so I don't suppose it's easy. And I'm sure officers have already thought about that. But I will go away and ask the question. So thank you very much for. Um, you know, for drawing that uh, that to to our attention, um, I think that I suppose what I would say is that I think that um, leaving aside the leaving aside the the, 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 oh, the other point I wanted to mention, which uh, again a, a number of people um, drew attention to, was, and we certainly need to think about it. Um, I think Councillor Bellinger mentioned, you know, are we going to see are we going to going to see an increase in um, uh, you know, in fly tipping or weight or, um, you know, windblown litter and all the rest of it, if we have less frequent collections and talk about foxes and, and all sorts of, and, and cats and other things, especially if you're on bad collections. I think that, I think those are all very valid points. Um, and, uh, and, 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 but, but to every problem, there is a solution and we need to think about that and we need to think about the impacts of that. As I said, all five of those proposals that are those options that were put forward in, that are put forward in this report in relation to waste centres and similarly the issues of the um, uh, libraries that we might not be able to retain but we would like to have retained. Um, all of those, you know, I'm, I am, you know, we want to look at those, we want to look at those issues and find ways around those, uh, around those problems if we possibly can. But I do come back to the original thinking behind this report which obviously I didn't write, I didn't take any responsibility for, but I am, you know, it is my duty to try to, to find a way forward with this. Um, it, this is not something of our, of our making, um, but, but on the other hand, we do have an in-year deficit of an accumulated deficit of nine hundred thousand pounds, and in in this particular um, in this particular directorate, and we have got a responsibility to try to do something about it. I think, as far as the question, and 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 a number of members have made reference to this. As far as the question about um, consultation around the budget for next year goes, um, I'm sure that there will be opportunities both within the council and and out with the council as per the legal requirements for that to happen. And of course, we will be looking to um, a budget council in late February for that. But this is about tackling this in-year deficit 
that's what I've got to try and do with the aid of officers and, 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 and fellow cabinet members. But I would like, but I'd just like to say thank you very much for, for all the comments. I think they are all um, very valid um, and, you know, people raising issues about having to make sure that we have thought about the possible consequent increases in expenditure as a result of what we think we're doing to save money. And I'm quite sure that um, officers will have done a lot of thinking about that, even though it may not have found its way into the report. But I certainly would have made a note of the comments that have been made here and will discuss those with officers um, once we have come to whatever decision cabinet intends to come to this evening. Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Councillor Carter, I'm not um, letting you come back in. I didn't let anyone else. And um, they, we all still have three other people who want to speak. But if there's points you want to follow up, please, please email Councillor Lynn and I'm sure she'll, she will pick them up further. Um, Councillor Holden, you're next as it happens. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'd just like to start by wishing Councillor Press a speedy recovery. Uh, it's very rarely we've seen eye to eye, but uh, I do wish wish her all the best in uh, in her treatment and and her recovery. Um, tonight to say I'm I'm disappointed is is probably an understatement. I've never seen, even at a full council, so much political jibing um, as I have this evening. We're at a time where all parties should be working together, cross party. We all know that financially we're in a hole. Now, there's been a complete lack of engagement and consultation across parties. You know, what I'm asking for is for us to start working together. There are solutions to this without some of the more drastic ones that are listed within this report. I'll pick a couple out. At the weekend, I was contacted by uh, a few residents who had read the career uh, with regards to Land Rover collections, I must declare an interest. I, my property does have a Land Rover collection where we're talking about end of lane collections. There are many residences, with, especially within my ward, where this just would not be practical. You know, I had an 81 and 82 year old at the weekend saying, how on earth are we supposed to get our waste to the end of a half mile track so that it can be collected. You know, if I was to leave the waste that we generate in my property and the property next door, which is serviced by a Land Rover, we would have to leave it at the bottom of the lane or the top of the lane. Either, either, prop, either end is on a road where there is no footpaths, still a very narrow road, but is serviced by the larger vehicles. There's, there's a lot of consequences in what you're asking it what you're asking the public to do, especially with this one item. But that goes further. You know, we've got a, prop a property next door where we've got six individuals that live there. They generate more than four bags of waste within that fortnightly collection period. So what they normally do is they go to Sobey Bridge House or Recycling Centre and they drop it off. They are not no different to many, many other families in my ward and in neighbouring rural wards. As we saw when Sobe Bridge um, House or Recycling Centre was uh, closed due to COVID and Elland, there was a 50% increase in fly tipping. Now I've done, done back of the fact packet calculations on how much fly tipping actually costs Collardale. And we're looking Roughly, on the figures that we've been provided with, we're probably looking at about £150,000 a year. What we should be doing is putting more effort into stopping things like that. You know, let's get, let's get a group of us around the table and start working on, on ideas that aren't going to impact on the communities that we represent as harshly as the ones that you're putting forward. My massive concern is that you're putting this into officers' hands who regardless of what happens, regardless of what services get cut, they're going to pick their wage up on the 15th of every month. There is no consequence to them whatsoever. And that isn't to say that they're not going to put any thought into what, what they're deciding, but it's us out there that are going to be affected. And what I'm asking for is for us all to work together on this. I know we've got to cut costs, 
That, that goes without saying. But I don't think knee-jerk reactions, especially when we don't actually know what the final settlement from government is going to be, I think we're being... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say reckless, but we're not being far from it. You know, and it's about time, all this political backbiting and jibes. We know the government's cut back. We don't need reminding every time. We know that 70% of the budget goes on children, young people and adult social care. We know that. We've heard it at every single meeting. We don't need reminding of it. We want to move forwards. And what I'm putting, putting, putting to you tonight, leader, is that you should set up a cross-party working party, which is going to look at the severe implications of, of the cuts that are being put forward tonight. Thank, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Rob. I mean, I know your views. I think it, the council has a, um, you know, has a majority that also carries a responsibility on people to put forward uh, decisions and take some responsibility and uh, that's that's what we're we're seeking to do here and i think i just disagree with you on one point where where you say you know we all know about the scale of the cuts and the 70 percent i have to say you know the evidence is a lot of people out there don't understand that 70 percent of their council tax goes on health and social social care and care for and care of vulnerable children that's part of the problem you know people people believe that primarily the council tax goes to pay for services like waste and things and don't understand i'm sorry if it's political but it you know spelling the facts out matters you know that there has been a conscious decision by central government to transfer huge amounts of costs for caring for the most vulnerable onto the council taxpayer, onto, onto local business rates, and that, that has had huge implications. And I think getting that message across, I'm afraid, is important. In terms of some of the other points, you know, I, I appreciate some of the tensions around the, um, the way you collect waste in rural areas. And I think Jenny indicated in her comments an intention to look very carefully at the, the, the relationship between the different elements of the savings proposals there, which are clearly not finalised. Um, I'm going to try and get through the list of the rest of members. Um, Councillor Greenwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, I want to sp uh, speak on um, mothballing halls. Um, but I do wonder about the selection process here. Um, as Councillor Scullion said, uh, Todmorden Hall is a gem. We're saving it. Um, and also, Councillor Lynn, on the subject of libraries, it we all understand it is, it is a real advantage to have a library in areas of deprivation. So I'd, I'd just like to remind everybody of that before I put forward my support of the hall in, in our area that is going to be mothballed. Um, I, I do appreciate in this difficult time that uh, the council need to find savings and make cuts, but there are some areas where you probably can, but there's others that I think we should look a bit closer. There hasn't been really any discussion or consultation over the proposals regarding Clay House in Westvale before issuing a public announcement that really, really upsets our local residents. Clay House, for example, it has three apartments. One of them was well refurbished, never been used. Two of them are unoccupied. And you look at this and say, is this the revenue stream that we're really missing here? Now, the third apartment is accommodated by a lady who's lived there for 17 years, and she's only just learned through local media that she may lose her home. Concerns and questions from local people is, is, is it the house for sale, the grounds for sale, just the house or the grounds? We don't know. There is a much used large football pitch used by a lot of young people. There is also a sports field for Westvale Primary School across the road who do not have a playing field. There are weddings booked for next year at Clay House. These were deferred from this year. And we local councillors have been approached by very distressed people over this weekend who feel that the most important day of their lives has been spoiled again. They booked caterers, flowers, all the rest for next year. And now it's, sorry, it's closed. Inquiries have taken place since they found out through Facebook about the spoiled wedding. 
um, oh, well, we might get our money back, but that's no compensation. I think this is an unacceptable way to deal with an issue like these. These grounds have been meticulously and patiently tended by a well-respected volunteers. They've planted out thousands of spring bulbs and flowers. It's a credit to them. The booking of the house is without doubt due, due to their care and attention to the, the uh, grounds, being able to have photographs in such a wonderful setting. They use daily of the grounds by walkers, people accessing North Dean Nature Trail, families using the play park, and also it's the start of the Calderdale Way. Many people think that Greetland and Stainland is an affluent ward. Well, not Westvale, our neighbourhood plan um, committee, we've had um, various uh, reports and things put together and there are many people on lower incomes and many people be below the average, um, uh, below the poverty line, to speak clearly about that. Now, Upper Greeton Library is now closed and won't reopen. And the local children also need access to books, computers, a quiet study space to do the homework. Ellen's too far away for many Westvale children, as is Stainland Library. Westvale Library was sold many years ago in the middle of West in, in the town, and the public hall was also sold. The public hall houses the old oak panelled council chamber. It still stands empty and in a state of disrepair in the middle of the village after the council sold it off. Nothing was gained by selling this hall, would Clay House be the same? How much more can the council take from Greetland? Nothing, because there won't be anything left to take. Clay House is not exactly comparable to Brick House Civic Hall. Clay House is one of the most imposing ancient structures in the Lower Calder Valley, situated in parkland, gardens and play areas. However, the council have not paid too much attention to it over the years, although it's been booked regularly for weddings and as a venue for other functions. The house was built by the Clay family between 1650 and 1661 on the site of an earlier house mentioned as far back as 1296. This is her heritage, it's history. Grade two listed and you want to just dispose of it and mothball it. The house and grounds were given to the people of Greetland in July 1924 in a ceremony when Councillor Smith announced to the press that his decision was right and was supported by the tremendous turnout of the town. And he was glad to place the house and grounds at the disposal of the public for all time. And that's in the press cutting. Clare House itself is also Greetland's war memorial and bears the plaque of the fallen in the main hall. Not just the plaque, the hall is the war memorial. I now wish to recommend that this matter is now referred for a cost benefit and social analysis to the appropriate panel for robust scrutiny. Clay House is a gem also. I do, I have been looking at the figures here to try and work them out, but quite honestly, um, they need further scrutiny. I can't make head and the tail of those. They don't make sense to me. So they need looking at further. Thank you very much for your time. Clay House is a gem. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Greenwood. I'm just checking whether anyone wants to, to comment immediately on that point. Um, yeah, uh, Sylvia, Councillor Dacre. Well, just to say that it, you kept referring to the hall being mothballed, but it would be mothballed whilst consultation was carried out with local groups, residents, as to how or whether it could be used, taken over by the community, that will be one of the points of mothballing it. Um, so it isn't just mothballing and that's it. May I come back there, Chair? Um, the thing is, like the public hall, we all know it, it's a grade two list of building. Anything that done on, needs doing on the building has to come through planning at the council. If it's so easy to do this, why don't we do the same to Todmorden Town Hall? Why don't we put that in the hands of uh, the public and save lots of money? 
this I, is very selective. Sorry, Councillor And I Greenwood. wonder why I it's so selective. I have nothing more to say about this. I'm I, very, very disappointed. I didn't allow Councillor Carter to come back, so I shouldn't really have allowed you, but I would make the point because I think I think Thank to be fair, as explained in the start that that um in the context of Cotopadon Town Hall, of course, there is a there is a specific funding funding stream available through the the year uh, the Tobinden, I forget the name thing, the Tobinden Town Town Fund, which is one of the one yeah, of the yeah the things of that nobody else there. gets. Thank you, um, Councillor Lee. Thank you, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of expressions of disappointment this evening, and I, I share that uh, that disappointment. Um, if it's a, is highly likely this is uh, approved this evening by Cabinet, we will be calling this in for further discussion, examination and debate to uh, probably place scrutiny, uh, even to internal audit, if it came to it. I'm disappointed because there was no opportunity for anybody but the ruling Labour group to have knowledge of this. We got the papers six days ago. And, you know, in some ways, irrespective of whether we agree with it or not, it's a very large comprehensive piece of work. So the worry that I've got is the work must have been going on with that work back in September when assurances were given, as we've heard earlier, that this wouldn't happen. And it's come out of the blue to everybody else. And this is just not constructive. Um, coming back to what Councillor Holden said, you know, if we're working together, if we're trying to get the best, this is not the best way for us to run this council. It just isn't. What, there's no notice and no discussion and as we've heard earlier from a number of councillors, you know, of all parties this evening, and particularly Jenny Lynn towards the, the end, and good luck with everything. Um, but we've heard excellent ideas coming from our councillors. And this has been the only opportunity that they've had thus far to make those contributions. And we mustn't forget, there's probably another 20 councillors not present this evening, that have intimate knowledge and detail of all of that we represent. And it just seems perverse to, for, for the Labour ruling group to have wanted to do it this way. Why on earth did you want to put this forward after so much research and work on the paper that's been produced with no discussion with anybody? because this is no longer an opinion. We've heard such good opinions expressed and local intimate knowledge from, I've just done a list, you know, from, from um, uh, Councillor Bellinger earlier on, Councillor Baker, and I do agree with his comments about process. I think he's spot on with that. Um, then we've heard from, um, from uh, Councillor Carter and Robinson, or, and now Greenwood, all coming up with the things that we all know that we know about in our in our own wards. Why wouldn't we want to have used all that expertise in coming up with the best way of getting out of, out of the, these problems? I've not enjoyed the party political stuff. Um, I think a, a, a unilateral uh, pessimistic decision has been taken. I don't know on what basis that the government won't provide the funding that it promised to. But having made that decision unilaterally behind closed doors without debate, the next thing that that then forces upon on the Labour group is you make the assumption and having made that, cut, cuts will be made necessary. Somebody's decided where the cuts will be made or suggested to be made. And I think we've heard tonight, there's many disparate views and opinions on that. And I think some of the things that have been chosen, we know from recent experience with the petitions that um, these mean a very great deal to the Calderdale public. And to many people, 
you know, the accepted Swiss argument that 70% of our expenditures is mandatory. But to many people in Condadale, the only tangible expenditure that they see being made on their behalf is these things, libraries and waste disposal, waste collection, the very, very important things to do. So I think we've made a mistake in the way that this, this has come to cabinet, in the way that it has. We'll be certainly doing our best at uh, uh, scrutiny to encourage a much wider discussion, like a number of people have said during the evening. And let's just try to quote Rob Holden. You know, we want to work together on this. I want to help. Our, our group wants to help with this. You can't help us help you if you operate on this basis. And I think finally, you know, if we really think that this is the way to go in our efforts to make Calderdale the Council of the Year in 2024, I'd really beg to differ. We can look at other means of, of making these savings without alienating most of our Calderdale uh, uh, population with things that they demonstrably and have recently demonstrably do not like. And, uh, you know, it's just a bad idea. So we will be calling it in. And uh, I'm just left with a sense of disappointment that no effort appears to have been made to even try to get close to all the elected representatives that have such tremendous knowledge of what's going on in Calderdale, and that's not come into the equation whatsoever. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, a couple of comments. Thank you to everybody who's contributed. I'm, I'm tempted to say if you said at the start you're going to call it in and might not have let people contribute for so long. Um, but actually I expected it would anyway. I, th I think a few people have got kind of um, um, rather rose-tinted views of how the budget process normally works. I mean, I, I suspect that probably some members had more chance today to comment about particular savings proposals and ideas than they normally would if we'd simply handled this as a full budget and brought forward a whole range of savings before. I think the second point to emphasize is, you know, this is, this is one part of what is a number of challenges if we are going to get anywhere near the kind of scale of savings that we've talked about. Um, it may be slightly pessimistic to say we need to make some savings now, but I'd remind you that the medium term financial strategy identifies a range of options, even the best of those would require us to save eight million pounds next year and that alone will require some very substantial and very difficult choices so um, I think all of these things we would need to be looking at w what I would say to many people is yes of course people have spoke eloquently about why they value particular services but I go back to what a number of people said at the start we all value these services but we also have a legal duty to provide a balanced budget and if this report goes to scrutiny it's absolutely fine it will be a greater opportunity for people to start to talk about alternative things they would save rather than why we shouldn't make these savings because that is the challenge at the end of the day councils are placed in a decision now where we have to make a choice between libraries and street lights between um, how our recycling service works and keeping keeping children safe and so on that that's that's the the reality of the situation that we're in and this will go on further um, Equally, I wouldn't say the range of um, proposals in these papers should be altogether surprising. If you look at the future council paper, if you look at some of the things in there, that very clearly identified the kinds of areas where things would be reviewed and the sorts of things we needed to start to look at. And this paper, in my view, follows on with those. A final view before I go back to other cabinet members and then clarify the recommendations because of a range we have gone on a considerable amount of time is that, um, it does seem to me that one of the big challenges we have in Calderdale is that everybody thinks the council should have lots of buildings, except they don't. I mean, most of the times over the last few years, 
I can remember budgets where opposition councillors, Conservative and Liberal Democrat councillors have stood up in budget meetings and said, Calderdale's got too many buildings, it should be reviewing them, it should be getting rid of more. I remember in 2014, uh, former Councillor Batty and um, Councillor Baines, who was then the Conservative leader, did a joint budget and, and that was a key part of what was going to happen. The problem is every time you say, actually, let's look at this particular building, somebody immediately says why it should be saved. And that's why we've got a big problem with our asset budget, a lot of costs tied up in a lot of different buildings. And somewhere in this, there's a critical choice between having buildings everywhere or having money to spend on services. Anyway, I suspect that's an argument we're going to keep repeating over the next few months. Um, I will check if there's any cabinet member who's not commented further, and then I want to clarify the recommendations before we formally agree them. I'm not seeing, sorry, Councillor Dake here. Yeah. Sorry, very quickly, just to say that there were points made about why we're doing this now and why a council and a, a, a councillor asked why aren't we waiting till we know what the final settlement is well because we can't afford to wait is one thing and just to say that this is not necessarily a party political point it was a point again made in the lga submission to government about the comprehensive spending review councils have had no certainty for years and they've got no certainty now and the risk is that without certainty councils may end up making cuts which they don't may not have had to have made if in fact the government does fully reimburse us and does increase our funding in the following next year but because we don't know we simply cannot afford to wait thank you councillor dacre so i want to move the two recommendations i want to amend recommendation 3.1 because i do take the point about some clarity about what will and won't require to come back to cabinet so at the end of 3.1, where it says implement the proposals, I'm amending that to say implement the proposals capable of being dealt with through delegated authority, but to bring back to a future cabinet meeting those that require a further cabinet decision and specifically decisions around library provision and waste and recycling. So with that amended wording, which I'm moving, can I see a seconder, please? Yes, Jane, thank you. Can I then see all cabinet members in, uh, are able to vote in favour? Thank you. None to the, well, that's unanimous, none to the contrary. So that's agreed. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your time and contributions this evening. And um, oh, that's the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you.